So uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Judith. That's going to take us to our first track here. Our first speaker is going to be Ari Sinha from Oregon State University. Uh, and then we've got a few other folks that are going to follow up. Uh, so welcome, Ari, to the front here. Oh, and actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, Andre Barbosa uh, from Oregon State University is going to give us a little bit of an introduction here and orient us to the session. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll get out of the way quickly. Um, do we have the for the, the slides? Slides. In this one. Yeah. So we'll, I'll go quickly. Um, so what you can see in the in the program, we're gonna have um, me just getting out of the way really quickly, and then I'll come back and present some of the work. Then we have Ari. Uh, Barbara Simpson is not here, but we'll have a Zoom presentation um, by one of her students. Um, and then myself, Ian Morell, Erica Fisher, um, and then we'll have 10 minutes at the end for discussion. Um, we, we try to put a lot of information into these slides um, and also into only one hour. You know how we all are. We could go on each of these presentations could go on for an hour. So uh, keep us on track as well. And I'll try to make every, sure everybody's on track with the timing. All right, keeping in the spirit, I'll try to get out of here as well quickly. Uh, my voice is a little bit down, so my idea would be to get through the presentation, uh, get through the slides quickly. Being coherent is not the objective today, but we'll try. Uh, that's me. This is our team. Uh, the project name is Innovative Lateral Structural Systems for Mass Timber Application. It was a part of the Immersion Lab Launch Initiative, we call it LE. Uh, part of our team is Andre Barbosa, who just got out of the way, you saw. Barb Simpson, who is in Zoom. A lot of students and postdocs and the uh, most amazing TDI staff, including Byron Miyamoto, Phil Mann, Mark Gehrig, uh, and an amazing postdoc called Tuho, who Simpson strong ties stole from us. But this is our team. Uh, we have a lot of industrial partners as well, whom I'll acknowledge uh, later on. So the idea, the project came about as we were kind of getting through this whole momentum of mass timber. Uh, there was a lot of momentum on veneer-based products. Um, and if you recall, I did a presentation before the pandemic on the development of mass ply panels that our lab with the support of TDI and EDA helped. So there's a lot of innovation in the veneer-based composites uh, area and uh, with MPP or mass ply panels, and now the Boise's new product called VLT, Vinyl Laminated Timber, we try to kind of create, uh, uh, we try to demonstrate a new lateral systems or different innovative lateral systems as part of, um, through the vehicle of veneer based composites. And in order, in doing so, we did uh, conduct a three story experiment or three story quasi-static uh, test that was done in the immersion lab. This is what the building looks like. Uh, Full-scale mass timber building, all veneer-based composites, beams and columns made out of LVL, slabs for mass ply panels or MPP, walls for mass ply panels. For the first two phases, the third phase was uh, veneer laminated timber, which is VLT, 40 by 40 footprint. And uh, the way we designed it, we could swap out different configurations of different wall systems and we tested them in phase. So the first phase and we did a quasi-static and took it to 4% drift. The first phase was uh, the first phase was a mass ply panel shear wall system with BRBs, buckling restraint brace frames as the energy dissipators. Generally you've seen them in 45 degrees, but we use them vertically, and it's a uh, similar design was done by KPFF for the Catalyst building. Um, so we used that. And the second phase was rocking mass timber walls with UFPs or U shaped flexure plate. Uh, um, we have tested this design a bunch of times. It's still in the performance based design realm, but it has also been used in uh, the Oregon Forest Science Complex, which is PV Hall. And then we set about with Fortis contractors' help. We kind of put it together, the building in three weeks. Um, mostly was uh, the panels were delivered on site. 
Phil from TDI helped us machine those parts to perfection using a CNC. And Ford has put that together in three weeks. So there's a lot of drilling, a lot of self-tapping screws, um, all provided by Simpson. Um, and then this is what the first and the second story looked like. And that after the building was completed, we put it to the test. And I let the time lapse do the talking and we took it very slowly. It took about two days back and forth, back and forth to 4% drift, which is about 13 inches at the top of the third story. So using three actuators slaved together And we had about 110 sensors in the building monitoring displacements and uh, <clears throat> loads and everything else that goes on in there. So for the phase one, the time lapse, you can see this building moving slowly and then also the BRB rocking walls or pivoting walls moving as well. This is the hysteresis I am basically engineer, so I have to throw one graph in at least. And this is the second phase, again, UFP wall systems. A lot of you who has been involved in different testing schedules with us or without us have probably seen this before, but we tested this with the vehicle of veneer-based composites. And now a lot of data is being collected. Data that has been collected is being used for numerical models as such um, to kind of predict um, predict different performances. Um, I did not talk about phase three. We did another phase with VLT panels and that was with coupled wall system. And now we are working with the students and the postdocs are working on journal publications, dissemination. Also in continuation and the spirit, we are also doing a shake table test that Andre Barbosa will talk about and he's leading that down in San Diego. And essentially the systems that were tested here, similar systems are being tested using actual ground motions down in San Diego. Again, it is not a one-off effort. We are part of a, it's a bigger collaborative effort and everybody is doing their part to kind of move the industry forward. 2017, we were involved in a two-story test, three-story at OCU. Then the Tallwood team did the 2023. A lot of people in the room, I can see you were involved in that. Um, and then we are, Andre is the lead for the six story test, which is going on right now. The construction is going on right now. We'll be testing in two weeks. And I'll let Andre do the talking on that, I guess. So with that, these are our partners and collaborators. Uh, shout out to all of them, Holmes, KBFF, Fortis, Simpson, Woodworks, um, and also the funders, USDA, ARS, and NSF. With that, I'll hand it over to Andre. Sorry. Thanks, sorry. Uh, Andre, if you want to stick up here, you'll be next. And uh, we've got one presentation that we're going to be seeing remote here. So we'll uh, double check. We can actually uh, see and hear them real quick. Uh, and if we're having any difficulties, then we'll just move to Andre and push him back. What he's going to be talking about is one of the phases, phase one. Um, that design concept has something that we've called a pivoting spine. Um, and the pivoting spine means that it's actually pivoting uh, in a point which is the middle of the wall. So those BRBs, the buckling restraint braces, were able to take both tension and compression forces, which is really how you can take them, make the most out of them. And um, it's a, it's an interesting design. Um, there were some good lessons learned. Um, good lessons learned was that there was no damage as anticipated in the wood panel. So that was good. Um, and then what was maybe, you know, if we do a little bit of modeling, it's conceivable is that the stiffness of the building system is lower than what we would like. So, so you gain one thing, but you're, you know, it's always a balance when you're doing design. If you really want to push one design parameter, sometimes you're giving up on others, uh, but hopefully you can give the presentation here um, for us. If not, I can... I'm I'm trying to share the screen. Um, I just want to confirm that everybody can hear me and see the presentation. It's like I can hear. It's like you're hearing somebody's headphones. I can hear him talk, but you guys probably can't, so it doesn't help you guys. Um, I think, I think we should just yeah. Let's move on to the next one.
I think in the interest of time, I'm sure Gustavo won't be too upset uh, or Barb. I'll I'll briefly go over um, the, the work here because um, we may not be able to get Gustavo back on. Um, so uh, here's the motivation, um, mitigate costs of physical experiments. Uh, robust validated numerical models are needed to reduce reliance on experimental testing. So even though we're going to talk about experiment, this project is actually of developing further numerical models, validating numerical models, collating a series of um, experiments that people can use to validate their models so that we can move, um, you know, starting to have more and more numerical modeling to look at new design options uh, moving forward. Um, so um, we've started in this project, we've started collecting um, a lot of tests that were done not only at OSU, but also we started collaborating with others that are willing to share some of their test data. And we're gonna include all of that into a database, um, mainly also using NSF's Design Safe. Um, so we've gone back and are collating and collecting all of this information into Design Safe so that others can use, but it's a consistent framework. And just the, they, the way the data is organized is also been, been made consistent. We've been working with Design Safe. Um, so this is National Science Foundation uh, database um, that is collecting all of the research, experimental research and numerical research done by funded projects by NSF, the National Science Foundation. And so we're working with them to integrate all our test results and the data on mass timber that we're collecting into Design Safe as well. Um, so the idea and the objective is to develop this new frontier of available test data to support numerical models, but we need to coordinate and disseminate existing data in mass timber research to synthesize collate experimental data to support validation of numerical models, assessment of design, assessment and design of mass timber buildings. Um, Barb Simpson um, is leading this effort, both with Ari and myself. So bringing this expertise in structural engineering with science numerical model and testing. And then Gustavo, who was going to present, he's now moved to Stanford. And um, Nick Tilson um, is in arriving in Bordeaux because he's working on the Woodrise and they were one of the teams selected for the Woodrise competition. There was five teams selected worldwide and OSU uh, has one team uh, participating there as well. So hopefully they'll bring they'll bring us the prize. Um, gather the, the goal of the project, gather the, the data, synthesize it into a database, collate the different, uh, compare and compare different uh, results and the data then be accessible for mass timber community for use in modeling and design. Um, what this looks like um, is on the top left, we've created basically a GUI that allows to input all the information that we're collecting from the different experiments. And then there's an engine, a database um, schema behind this that we've created, and it automatically links to Design Safe. So it essentially just helps us bring that information quicker um, because it, it is a lot of effort if you've done any experiments to collect the data and then even be able to share it but this way it's going into this uh, national funded design safe database for others to use um, then one example um, is a work that um, barb and gustavo are doing on numerical modeling of rocking walls um, looking um, at the literature, there's different ways in which you can model these, less detailed, more detailed uh, modeling from, um, you know, all the way on the right where you're modeling those, all those little squares are finite element models, trying to capture the orthotropic properties across the depth of the walls and modeling at the bottom, all the effects of nonlinearities in the wall, but also compression where we expect damage to occur. Uh, with springs, modeling, posting. So to develop those models, we needed that database um, to look at those. The work is focusing on three-story and six-story uh, models, the three-story, the, the project that Ari was telling us about, and then the six-story that I'll talk more um, a little bit later. So um, they're focusing now on modeling this, the, this pivoting uh, spine, looking a little bit more in detail there in the middle you can see the rocking panel, which is the mass supply panel as indicated there. And then the buckling restraint braces at the at the ends. I was mentioning that was a pivoting spine. 
So there's actually a gap there. If you look carefully, the wall is only touching the foundation at a middle point, um, which is that point at which the wall can pivot. Um, and then the buckling restraint brace is connected to the foundation there. This could be any steel foundation or a steel plate on a concrete foundation um, that could work as well. Um, on the right is just an example of how we're making that connection to the mass timber wall. And um, I believe it was with Holmes and with KPFF that we had quite a bit of discussion back and forth as we looked at different options that you have for making those connections. We went with an option where you have the largest stiffness and smallest um, de de deformation in that connection. So all those screws are at 45 degrees so that we have um, the largest stiffness and smallest deformation. And those connections are what we call capacity design. So they're designed so we have no damage in that connection. All the damage and the replaceable fuse of these buildings would be the buckling restraint braces. The goal is to develop these models. So um, now, um, you know, put on a hat of a structural engineer and we're looking at the skeleton of our body. In this case, it's a skeleton of the building and that skeleton is being modeled at all the different joints, right? Like you have the joint in your elbow of your knees. We're modeling all those little joints in the building as well and um, trying to capture all the behavior that we know are important behavior. So be it at beam column joint connections or at the, the bottom of the foundation, but it becomes really trying to capture um, the, the right behavior um, there. Specifically on the buckling restraint braces, there's a few variables here that help us in the design phase, but also in the modeling phase, capture the different sources of deformation and where the model goes nonlinear. Um, this is modeled with an open seas element called co-rotational truss. Um, but what it allows us to do is to compare um, with the experiment. So um, in blue is the uh, numerical modeling and in gray it were actual tests that were done on other BRBs so were pretty close um, there. Um, and this is an example of a brace that is similar to the braces that we tested in the building. And then in the end, this is um, the response um, and the experiment, the, the numerical modeling in gray was the um, actual experiment that we got. Very specifically, I was mentioned one of the lessons learned, although it, we didn't have to do a test to learn that lesson, but one thing to remember with this pivoting spine um, is that the BRBs and what's different between this design and the rocking wall designs with post-tensioning is you see at the end there, that circle is where the test stopped. Meaning after we had no force, the building was damaged, the buckling restraint braces were damaged. It's only those that were damaged, but the building would actually be leaning in this test. So on if we want a building that's going to be more resilient and we want the building to remain vertical after a big earthquake, then we have to add post-tensioning in the walls to help it self-center uh, there. But um, if it's even for a building that does not have that objective of being a resilient building, you still have all you would need to do would be pushback, which may sound like a lot, but it's not that much after big earthquake. You can actually push the building back into position and just replace those BRBs and the rest of the building, at least the structure of the building would be fine. And that is still resilient. So there's pros and cons about adding post-tensioning, but at least here without the post-tensioning, we would have that residual drift there. Um, but overall the models performed well and we were able to then take that into what we're doing now. And I'll talk more about the sixth story, but we're taking that design with post-tensioning now over to the shake table so that at least on the shake table design, we'll have a six story building that after the earthquake we was gonna self-center again. Um, here are just some numerical models of the, the six story and things that we need to know uh, as we're designing these buildings, which are the periods um, of the building. So. Um, the, this is the shaking period in one direction. The, the second direction, um, and I'll show more of the building later so you can understand more, but, um, and this is the torsion uh, there. We designed this building for the six-story shake table test for a site in Seattle. And we have to select round motions right now, just following what would be a performance-based design uh, approach as well. And 
the way we've designed it is such that the mean response there in the black line, which is the mean interstory drift, how each floor is actually displacing uh, divided by the height of each floor, um, that is less than 2%. This is actually, the black line is for, for um, the average for maximum considered earthquake level. So earthquake will be 2,500 year return period. And we are well below the design level, which is the red line. Um, so showing that we would have um, meet all the criteria that is your required per building codes. Um, this is the the response in accelerations. Um, so the actual floor accelerations in red is what you do today uh, by design. And though the, that profile shows that the higher modes uh, are important as well. So these would be the floor accelerations. So to remember, if you're buying the penthouse in the roof, you will see you will feel the largest shaking um, up on the roof. It's actually the story below where it doesn't shake so much. And then, you know, imagine my belly, my belly right there in the second, third story. That's where um, you're going to have also higher accelerations. So penthouse is great. You have a great view. But if you worry about earthquakes, maybe that's not the place you want to be. Um, and then we also check the walls, uh, both in terms of bending and shear, and make sure we um, check everything. Um, a lot of participants and a lot of support uh, for this project. Um, and so I want to thank all our um, speaker, all our contributors here for this one. Um, I'll move on to the next talk. Um, yeah, I'll move over to now that's me. Um, this is before I, um, you know, take shaved. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the the, the six story project. Um, and there's actually two sources of funding. Well, there's multiple sources of funding, but uh, two main federal agencies. Um, one is uh, the NSF uh, funding that we got, and then the other one is the ARS program, the USDA ARS program. Um, I'm talking here mainly about the NSF funded part. Um, and here are the PIs for the NSF project. Um, Barb, who was initially was at OSU and now has moved. Ari, you've heard him talk. On the right, John Vandalin from Colorado State. And on the bottom um, in architectural engineering department at Penn State, Nathan Brown was doing helping us with a lot of work on optimization of our design method. Um, again, all this work is only possible with a huge group of collaborators, specifically now on the six-story phase, a uh, six-story building that we're working on. Um, we have uh, Steve Pryor on the left with Simpson. Uh, Ling Pei is still, he's the lead of the 10-story project. And um, all the work that we're doing is not possible without him. So I have to acknowledge, even now, I think every day I'm texting with him five, 10 times with, how did you do this, Ling? And why did you do that? And he's always amazing and very active responding. One of the phases there in the middle, we have Corebrace, who are the developer of the BRBs. So we're extending that into the six-story shake table. Um, these buildings, like the one on the shake table, I'll show you, we have some non-structural elements. We have some facades, some partition walls. We also have stairs. And especially on a shake table test, the stairs have to remain functional throughout our testing program so that we can actually access the building up and down, right? Of course, we could use a boom lift, but it's so much more comfortable um, going up the stairs. Um, so we have uh, Tara Hutchinson and Kevin Smith from CS Construction Specialties who are helping that uh, with us there. Um, our designs of the lateral force resisting systems um, have been confirmed and verified by um, Reed Zimmerman, uh, diaphragm design for the 10th story. And they've helped us check for the six-story building as well, uh, Alex Wilson at MKA, uh, just to make sure that all our non-structural systems, which were actually done by Kerry Ryan for the 10th story, are still functioning. And we understand all the details of her design. Um, she's also helping us there. And then one of the things that was not tested on the 10th story shake table test that was done was fire sprinklers. And in work being done actually by NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, it was identified that one of the key things that we have less information on is actually the performance of fire sprinklers. And you can you know, even look up here around us in the building, you look up here, they're not painted red. So it may take a minute to find the piping and the fire sprinklers 
but they're here. Um, and we don't have enough information, enough testing data on the performance of fire sprinklers. So NIST approached us. Um, and because there's not a lot of six story shake table tests going on at this time, they said, oh, we want you guys to do uh, and put in some fire sprinklers. There's no other in the world right now, um, six story test going, shake table test going on. So they approached and said, we would like to put fire sprinklers on the building. And so we're working on that now and phase two of our testing. So in December, when we test phase two, um, we'll have uh, fire sprinklers as well. All this work is only possible with a lot of students. They're doing a lot of this work and make, making sure that we actually keep on track as well. The ones that are highlighted in red have already made it down to the shake table or are still there um, on the shape table, making sure that we keep um, doing all this work. And then all others, for example, like Gustavo there, um, Stanford, the first one on the left, um, are also helping us with all the analysis work um, you know, ahead of us doing the work and then as data comes in they're helping us processing so it's a large team of professors and faculty but it's also a large team of students and a large team of industry collaborators to make this possible what we're looking at is this idea of converging design and for converging design we are integrating functionality based um, design so looking at the functionality of the building and also looking at um, sustainability and combining sustainability and functionality into one design methodology. Most right now, there's no way of including from the initial stage, people keep track of it, but it's not a actually a design parameter, the sustainability of the building. So we're integrating that with resilience and functionality into one design methodology. So to support this search for resilient, sustainable and innovative lateral force resisting systems. Um, we have a large project. Uh, only one component I'm going to focus on now is the task 4.1 there in green at the bottom. The task 2.3 prototype testing, including what, what Ari mentioned was the three-story as well, but now looking at the six-story um, building. And um, I'll jump straight to the new pictures that we have, uh, but we um, started late June, early July, uh, we started with the demo of the top four stories of the building. Um, really interesting. Um, we hired a contractor uh, who's a demo expert and had a lot of conversations with them. They came up with a plan of how to do the, the work, but it included basically, you know, if you had, I don't have a video yet um, organized for this, but if you imagine the construction process, you know, then press reverse and a little bit faster. Um, that is exactly the, the deconstruction with a few more details. So they went to the splines, took out a few screws, the panels that were long panels, they could lift as one block and put it to the side of the building. And then um, walls, those came as one whole piece over three stories. Those for safety, they were actually cutting um, one story at a time. Um, and so what they would do is the, the figure on the top left, they would strap up that top part and then with a humongous big saw, um, they would go ahead and cut that. Um, any idea of how long that takes to do to take out that top part of the wall there? This is some votes. Anybody? Three hours, okay. Four hours. 15? Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Each wall, half hour. Okay, now to get to that half hour, they took a day to prep, right? Not only the wall, but all around. They had to make the holes, they had to detach some of the other parts. So when they started, they were doing about one week per story. Um, this is on a 45 by 25 um, square foot building. Um, but at the end of this program, they were doing about two and a half days a story. Okay, um, so really they learned uh, along the the process. So as this just to say, as if we start thinking about building reuse, this is a very particular building because it's on a shake table. But as we start thinking about building re reuse, which is part of our other project that we have with UFO as well, 
um, we can start thinking about how these elements can be deconstructed and reused um, in other structures as well um, with the actual you know, work being done uh, in the field. Um, this one was a, a cool one that I, that I found. Ling and Reed sent me the picture on the left. And um, I tried to imagine what was the right lighting. So if you go around 8 a.m., this is San Diego, right? So the sun is out and it's a sunny day. The one on the right is, again, 8 a.m., about a year later. Um, but um, that's a picture of now the building without the top four stories. Mm -hmm. And that's the one that we have some a few more months to play with. Um, for those that don't know, this building is a, a very healthy Frankenstein of a mass timber display. Um, two stories, level two and three are CLT. Then we have glue lamp floors, and then we have NLT and DLT. Both NLT and DLT, our friends from StructureCraft, were the one uh, fabricating those. Um, gravity beam system, LVLs from Boise Cascade. Um, one thing I have to note, and this was not thing one thing that I had to worry about, but something that Ling had to worry about, all of these materials were donated. And so there's a lot of industry interest and collaboration to make this, this possible. And then we have CLT walls and MPP walls, MPP from Freris and CLT walls from um, SmartLamp. Now on the six story phase, we're doing three phases on the six story building. The one on the left, which is um, more also for baseline comparison, and to get data on a six-story building, it's a similar design to what was done on the 10-story. So we have post-tensioned rocking walls, and we have U steel flexural plates uh, there. So that's phase one. Phase two, we're going to exercise two important things. One is, can we actually replace a self-centering rocking wall? We're going to replace a whole wall over six stories. We'll do that in the north, uh, sorry, the east and west walls, and we will come back and put in a new six-story wall, this time with the buckling restraint braces and post-tension. And then we have a phase three, which is, well, be it from damage or be it from initial design, what do we have a hybrid solution? We have a solution that has a steel, um, BRB, in this case called a steel or resilient steel brace frame. And um, in the other direction, we have CLT walls. So I'll try to showcase that a little bit here. So the first phase, um, if anybody's seen presentations by Link, looks very similar to what he did. Um, so it has important pieces, our shear keys, um, looking at the figure on the right, shear keys that allow us to transfer forces from the floors to the walls. The UFPs, U flexural plates, um, those take the energy dissipation. And then the post-tensioning rods, as I had mentioned before, are the ones that help us self-center the building. Um, phase two, we have the buckling restraint bases, post-tensioning, and we have the, it's, it's similar design, just instead of having energy dissipators distributed along the height of the building, we have them focused on one story. And then, oops, there we go. One more. And then this um, new solution that um, has products from Simpson, but um, has um, it's also a, a new design where we're exploring yield moment link, so moment connections that looks like the one on the top right, where all the inelasticity is concentrated there. All other elements that are not shown in, in yellow um, are protecti protective designed or capacity designed uh, to not experience damage. The new brace that they have um, is similar to the buckling restraint brace, uh, but has a slightly innovative solution. All of these pictures are online, so you can see those as well. But the photo on the right is a pretty interesting design um, that does the same. It concentrates all the yielding in that location. And then you have orange plates that you put on top of that. So um, to restrain those energy dissipation mechanism for buckling. Uh, so it's a buckling restraint plate. Uh, for those those in orange. So it's it's a new design, new concept, and we want to show that you can have a building that in one direction has CLT walls, in the other direction has a hybrid, um, but also that in this design with these connections, we can control the damage and have replaceable fuses in smaller various parts of the structure. We 
Okay. We're at the stage where we are, we have our plan updated and we have only uh, 800 channels of data that we're going to be collecting. Um, the maximum we can use is 805. So we started at 900 and we realized we would not have two more weeks um, to put more uh, strain gauges and more elements, but um, we're going to have it severely and heavily uh, instrumented, but there's always more things that I would like to measure. Here's our um, updated timeline of where we're at with all these different phases. Um, phase one will be done by November 3rd with all the testing. Phase two, we've already received materials on site. Um, I'm not a project manager and I've never done construction management, but that's really what I feel I'm doing right now. It's all construction management work, um, which I'm learning on the job, which sometimes it's not the best place to be learning on the job, but um, this is where we're at. Um, we have a day that we're, you guys will hear soon about, which is going to, we're going to have a TDI day still to be defined, but sometime in December, Ian and Evan and Judith will invite whoever's interested in coming down to the shake table and we can show you around, get to visit um, all the different things we're doing um, on the shake table. Um, but early in December, if it starts getting rainy in you know, the Northwest, you need to travel to San Diego, consider that and come and visit us um, early in December. If you wanna come later, that's possible too, but think about early December. It's still good to go to the beach, usually in early December. Um, phase three, um, we have to be done by um, that second week of February because then we have to do deconstruction um, and we have to be out of the shake table by the end, well, first week of April. The deconstruction ties into work that we're doing with um, Judith and Mark I think, back there uh, because we're tracking the deconstruction times, we're tracking the deconstruction effort, and we're bringing that back into LCA, looking at different end of life scenarios. And if anybody, um, and I know some architects here, are interested in exploring steel connections, in exploring beams and columns from a six story building, we're looking for uses just for, for those buildings. So do consider that please. Um, and we just have to build that. If we know early, we can or get that organized and make it so that it comes to your projects and then you can have that part of the story of a building that has seen many, many, many ground motions, but also the reuse story. Um, and as we move forward into this, I cannot skip that one. Um, on the left, two columns, we have the partners on, uh, you know, heavily involved on a six story. On the right two columns, we are reusing a building. Um, we started with a 10-story building, and we were fortunate enough to get grants to be able to work on the six-story. So those are all the folks that were involved in the 10-story. Our six-story tests would not be possible without the, the legacy uh, partners that we have here um, also uh, in this work. Very quickly to wrap up, a minute, okay. Um, this is React. You've heard about React uh, from, from Ian and Judith uh, earlier today. And, and we have uh, one of our first projects that we did testing. This was driven totally by the members. The members decided what the mo most important achievable tasks were and things they wanted to test. There was no available uh, public data um, for point supported slabs. So five different members, all structural designers got together, came up with what they wanted to test and then worked with us at OSU um, to come up with a testing program to answer those questions. So we came up with this at um, 10 feet by 32 feet point supported slab, supported on six points. Um, the design of this has nothing to do with me. Uh, it's again, those members from React came up with the loads, came up with what we wanted to do, but we just helped them um, with that. One of the key questions was load sharing, um, how much load goes to each column. So we did that. Then we did vibration testing and we did pre-construction load testing so that you guys can now use that in other projects as you try to think about how to use this point supported slabs. We tracked um, failures and punching shear failures or rolling shear uh, failures. And um, then we did, just to show an example, okay. And we tracked for different specimens, the capacities for these as well.
Thank you, Andre. All right. We have Ian Morell up next. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Ian Morell. I'm a just skip this slide. Good to point this somewhere. Two. Perfect, perfect. Uh, my name is Ian Morell. I'm a postdoc at Oregon State University. And I'm presenting on behalf of Christopher Higgins, who could not be here, unfortunately. But this, I'm going to present quickly on creep acoustic and vibration performance of CLT concrete composite floor systems. So this is kind of a continuation. There was a first part of funding that ended about a year and a half ago. And we, from there, looked into the, the how single fasteners worked, move that up to how one-way beams would work with CLT and concrete composites, as well as some two-way action. But we still need to figure out what's happening with creep, vibration, and the acoustic performance. So that's mainly what we're going to focus on here. So for creep, currently there's a research plan, and the goal is to compare the what's currently there with the gamma method, moment curvature, as well as some nonlinear finite element analysis using Abacus. And all that's trying to use a typical normal building that exists. So a 24-foot span looking at 5-ply CLT, a pretty thin concrete topping slab, as well as looking at different shoring conditions and also different fastener types and spacing and look at the strength and deflection limits of this. And there are some examples of how these models work. So on the left there is a theoretical slip distribution using both moment curvature analysis and the gamma method. And the big thing here is to say compared to experimental results and it works pretty well in the linear range. On, the, on your right, there is the same analysis with moment curvature, but using the actual slip uh, distributions from that test. And you can see it works better and actually incorporates in the nonlinearity. And that can be important for higher deformations in those. From there, the bigger movement here is looking at finite element analysis. So this is just showing a model of a five ply CLT beam and set up the same way as the previous experiments that were done and using some values from the literature from 1968. And surprisingly, this works really well. We got this to line up really well with the displacements and the stress and the forces in there with the black line being the abacus and the other two lines being the experimental tests. And from there, they went and moved on to adding concrete. So with this, you need to add in steel wire welded mesh as well as concrete properties. And then also the connectors because to make something composite, you need to connect the CLT and the concrete. So for this, we used experimental results for some push off tests from previous research, as well as a translator type of spring. And again, if we model this exactly using all these pieces and these values from 1968 for Norway spruce, this again works pretty well. And you can see here, there's a slip between the CLT and the concrete up there, which should occur because this is not a perfectly composite beam. You will not create a perfectly composite beam in wood, but it works pretty well. But this is just what we have now. We don't have creep in here. We just have a static load. So one of the pieces that's missing to be able to model this is the creep in the fasteners. There's a lot of research on creep in wood. There's a lot of research on creep in concrete. Steel, we don't really worry that much about creep. But we need to understand how the fasteners work. And to do this, we need some physical experiments. So what's going to be done is setting up individual creep tests. You have a single fastener that's going to be in there, and you pour concrete on it, and you use a spring to apply a set load to it. And then you're going to keep this going for 200 days of loading, and then you're going to take off the load and see how the creep recovers. So take a giant CLT beam, put a hole in these little blocks of concrete on them, apply force, and measure what's happening. And looking at two magnitudes, both the yielding of the fastener, just below yielding to not actually have it yield, and half the yielding, as well as a couple of different fasteners, one a washer screw from the previous research, as well as a fully threaded and partially threaded screw, which have been used in previous projects. And looking at both Douglas fir and SPF. And once you have these values, which can feed right into your abacus model, we move on to full specimens. So the goal here is we make a stack of different CLT and concrete beams, and we can apply load on them. So that way we can actually see how this creeps over 200 days. And you only get to apply load at two places and you get the creep in all of them. So all about efficiency of space. But looking at different fasteners, 
in there and the different CLT species as well as spacing. And that will follow the similar thing of loading for 200 days, unloading for 100 and seeing how the creep occurs and how it recovers after loads taken off. Then the last two pieces of this is we need to look into acoustics. Acoustics is a very important part. I'm an engineer, so I don't know it as well as the architects in the room, but it is very important. And so for this, we use an ISO tapping machine over acoustic chambers and look at both the panel before concrete is poured as well as afterward to see the gains from adding there. There won't be acoustic maps just because we want to see what is what do we gain just of the concrete and the CLT together, as well as there will be some changes with the placement of the fasteners. The idea is what if we put as many fasteners as possible into one of these, because there's been concerns about bridging for both acoustics and vibration through the fasteners connecting the concrete and the CLT. Let's see how that actually acts. And then using essentially the same setup and the same panels, also look at accelerometers and use an eccentric mass shaker at different portion, portions of the span, both for positive and negative bending to understand how the vibration affects and how those change by the addition of concrete and the addition of composite action. The other half of this is there's a REACTS project looking at notched glue lambs and reinforcement of glue lambs. So this project is basically just started. They have now an index and there's now a student. So we got those pieces going. The student has been doing um, a literature review into focusing on this. And the goal is probably gonna be reinforcing these notches with self-tapping screws to avoid that tension perpendicular to the grain. But there'll be a lot more to come with that project as time goes on. And I think we caught up a bit on time, which was my goal. If there's any questions, we'll talk to you guys later. But thank you so much for your time. I think we might have all right, thank you, Ian. Well done. You uh, you bought us a few minutes, so we appreciate that. All right, uh, up next we've got Erica Fisher. All right. Um, so I'll try to catch us up. Um, I am going to, going to show you no plots or graphs or talk no numbers because this project just started two weeks ago. Um, so I will talk about hopeful views for the future of what we hope to do. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm Erica Fisher. I'm an associate professor in the School of Civil and Construction Engineering um, and also in the Department of Wood Science and Engineering. It's not going. There we go. Okay, so so one question that we were asking ourselves um, as we developed this project that's in collaboration with Mark Bretz at University of Oregon, as well as Adam Phillips at Virginia Tech, was what are some of the barriers to tall timber buildings? You saw um, Andre talk about using steel lateral force resisting systems in timber buildings. This is really common, um, all of you know. Um, and so how do we make those connections? How do we decrease these barriers? Um, and, and one of these barriers really is um, these hybrid steel um, CLT floors or steel mass timber floors. Steel as a gravity system is, is quite useful and steel and timber have a lot of synergies together with sustainability um, as well as with just, you know, the, the industrial look of having it exposed. Um, and so there are a lot of assumptions though that are going into these buildings, particularly around um, vibration. And so that's where this project really focuses um, its, its, um, its scope. Um, so this project is actually in collaboration with a Charles Pankow Foundation funded project that was announced this morning. So the timing could not be better. Um, and so um, the Charles Pankow Foundation um, sources from a lot of industry partners for, for funding um, and including AISC, including many of the companies of, of you all that contributed to this project. So this project is going to be funded by both the timber industry as well as the steel industry, which is really unique. Um, and so our goal here, and this is a little small, but 
Um, we will first be performing some push out tests to really understand the force slip behavior of these connectors. How much composite action can we get out of these connectors themselves? Um, and that information is going to feed into a lot of the numerical modeling that we will do. You've seen today already that we, we love our numerical models. It allows us to further understand what's happening in our structure beyond the data that we can actually collect in our experiments. We will be doing some large scale vibration tests at Emerson Lab, um, as well as some large scale diaphragm tests um, at Emerson Lab as well on these steel mass timber hybrid floors. We will also be incorporating a lot of these trade-offs that we're making in our buildings into an LCA, and that's where we're working collaboratively with Mark Fretz at University of Oregon. We're, we're considering a lot when we're designing these mass timber buildings. Um, and, you know, it's, it's what is our performance? objective? Is it strength? Is it stiffness? Is it sustainability? Sometimes it's all of it. So how do we understand those trade-offs that we're making um, within our building? Trade-offs for strength, trade-offs for carbon. Um, and so we'll be working um, with Mark to, to, to figure that out. Um, all of this work will be published on Design Safe is our intention so that um, we can continue building off of each other's LCAs. I feel like this is kind of the buzzword of today. Everyone's doing an LCA. Um, and so how can we continue to, to improve and to build off of each other's work um, so that we don't keep starting from scratch for every single project? Um, so here are the research objectives for, for the project itself. You can see it's a much bigger collaboration with um, many people from industry, with, with other organizations, as well as with the steel industry. Um, and these are our partner linkages, um, as well as many others that have contributed through the Charles Pankow Foundation. And that's it. Hopefully I caught us up. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Thank you, Erica. And we'll be hearing from Erica uh on fire just after the break that's coming up and we've got just a few more updates from Andre. Will, will we have some time for questions? Okay, so um, just to wrap up here, um, two other new um, React projects. Um, the first one is on timber brace frames. Uh, we actually got the really go ahead also two weeks ago, um, but we're gonna be looking at um, a design method for timber brace frames focusing on um, seismic um, S, B, uh, B, and C. Um, but this is, is uh, going to come up in the works now. Um, there's quite a bit of research um, that has been done by many, but um, Marian Popovsky, he's been, he has been the main person, both going back to his PhD times, but also uh, more recently with work done by FP Innovations. Um, as you know, 2021 is the latest work on this, where they actually in Canada have uh, design method and an approach that um, we, we're going to be using as as the basis. Um, very quickly, um, here uh, are the scopes. You can focus on the big, uh, bolded um, text only. Uh, we're going to develop uh, draft design provisions and commentary uh, for all of us to be able to use, develop archetype buildings, and nonlinear analysis and processing. The development of the design provisions and commentary we're doing at OSU, the literature review, but KPFF is leading that work. Um, uh, Lever is developing the plans for our archetype buildings, and KPFF is working with Lever closely as well to inform general sizing of our structural elements. And um, we will be doing the detailed um, design at OSU of those archetypes. And then lastly, on the nonlinear modeling, uh, small type FEMA uh, P695 type study uh, is going to be led by OSU with support by KPFF. So just work to be done, but for you guys to know what we're, what's going on. And then one of the other items that React's membership said they're really interested in, but they felt that we need a, a bigger and better literature review before the membership goes into more of this work. Um, is on um, uh, slab uh, rib, um, so composite systems, timber to timber composite systems uh, with um, CLT deck or MPP deck and glue lamps uh, or LVL beams. And this is actually work that was done by Hans Eric um, here um, while at Katera. But just to show you an example of um, design that went into the catalyst, 
that had to look at connection details and looking at different screws, different adhesives, and then some structural testing that was done, just the type of literature review that we're collecting to then uh, inform um, future work as well. So it seems we are out of time for questions and sorry for me stumbling over some of the presentations that I hadn't practiced, but um, I think we can catch up over coffee and other things. Thank you, Andre. All right, let's give the uh, presenters a round of applause. All right, well, uh, we're gonna have a 15 minute break here. Uh, I'll start reconvening folks, 2.15 uh, and we'll move to the fire track.